consider a heated metallic rod with some temperature distribution. How will the heat dissipate over time? Or in simple terms, what will the temperature be at each point as the time progresses? Heat equation is the partial differential equation that will help answer this question. In this video, I'll be answering two main questions. How do we actually get the heat equation? What are the boundary conditions and why do we even need them? For the first question, I'll start with the very basics of conservation of heat energy and Fourier's law of heat conduction. Using these two, I'll get the final form of the heat equation. To explain the importance of boundary conditions, I'll use a special case known as steady state heat equation and solve it analytically. During this process, we actually see why we need boundary conditions. But let's not get too much ahead of ourselves and move back to the question of how can we actually derive this heat equation. As you can see that the heat equation in 1D itself looks quite scary with the time derivative and a second order spatial derivative of the temperature distribution with some coefficients c, rho, kappa, all of these attached to both time and space derivatives alongside a source term. Let's just see how we actually come up with this partial differential equation. Consider a thin and insulated metallic rod. When I say thin, it means that there's just one spatial dimension and insulation ensures that the heat is trapped inside the rod and does not escape to the surroundings. There's also some initial temperature distribution along its length and notice that over time, heat is distributed inside the rod making hot parts cooler and cold parts warmer. Considering a specific segment of the rod, for which I can say that as the rod is insulated, the change in heat energy with time depends on the heat entering from one side of the segment and leaving from the other. Notice how over time, the cooler parts of the rod are getting warmer and the temperature is spread out over the whole length. In summary, the heat enters the segment at a location say x and exits at x plus delta x. I can denote these values as qx and qx plus delta x respectively, which is also known as flux. The rate of change of heat energy then is just the difference between these two terms. Now, as the length of the segment is delta x, I can just divide by this number to get a fair representation for the specific segment. Taking the minus sign out, I can see it taking somewhat a form of a derivative of flux at a point x. In fact, as this segment is really small, I can write this as dq by dx. There is one last thing that I haven't discussed, and that's a heat source. It is possible that the rod is heated by an external source like a blowtorch or maybe some radioactive decay causing heat to generate from inside. In any case, to account for this, I need to add a source term to our equation and get a complete equation defining how the heat energy changes with respect to time. Now there are several terms staring at us, but if you remember, we need to know the temperature of the rod. So somehow I have to find a way to equate the heat energy and this flux term to the temperature. As far as heat energy is concerned, it's pretty simple. It's just the product of heat capacity, density, and the temperature of the material. However, to equate the change of flux to the temperature, we will need Fourier's law of heat conduction. According to this law, Q is directly proportional to the negative gradient of the temperature. But before I move further, let me make a point clear. Fourier's law of heat conduction cannot be derived from first principles. This is just how heat flow occurs. Now, moving back to how we actually get the law, consider a metallic rod with one side heated to a temperature of say 25 degrees and the other side kept at 0 degrees with a linear transition temperature between the two sections. Heat always flows from hotter to a cooler section. So we'll see the flux between the point 0 and 5 from left to right. Now if the temperature on the left side was 15 instead of a 25, heat would still move from left to right but the amount would be reduced. So we can say that the heat flux is related to the temperature gradient which is equal to the slope of this line such that it's directly proportional to the negative temperature gradient. Finally, 
This proportionality is present because apart from the temperature gradient, flux also depends on the material property. This should be quite clear as we know that heat movement depends on the type of material. For example, iron conducts heat more than a glass. So we can just add another term called kappa, which is the coefficient of thermal conductivity and is just a material property. Plugging these terms back into the conservation of heat energy, we get the complete heat equation which relates the change in temperature with respect to time and space along with the material properties and some heat source. Now that we have the equation in its glory, let's take a look at it in a little more detail. I'm going to make a very few reasonable assumptions and one of those is that the material is homogeneous and its properties does not change over time. What this does is allows us to move the coefficient safely outside the time and spatial derivatives. Moving C and rho over to the right hand side, we get the thermal diffusivity term next to the spatial derivative which basically tells us how the heat diffuses in the material. Note that the constant dividing the source term just acts as a scaling factor and can be absorbed into the source term itself. If you remember, this equation dictates how the temperature distribution changes over time. And looking carefully, after a certain period of time, the temperature does not change much. What if I only need to find this steady state where the temperature does not change? It would be quite wasteful to run all these iterations. We can achieve this final steady state solution directly by solving an alternative equation. We can get that equation by just setting the derivative with respect to time to zero. By the way, this equation is known as steady state heat equation. For a moment, assume alpha and q are one. Now we can easily solve this equation by integrating it twice. Wait a moment, uh, what are the values of these constants a and b? To answer this, I have to take you back to when I was deriving the equation. If you remember, I conveniently and somewhat deceptively zoomed in nicely at the center and started showing a flux from left to right and how temperature in the specific segment changes as the result of this heat exchange. The question now is, what about the leftmost end? We can't have a flux in from there because it is an insulated rod. This is where we have to define a boundary condition. Boundary conditions are a part of the problem that we are trying to solve. It could be something as simple as saying, let's just put the two ends on an infinite block of ice such that the temperature at the two ends is always zero. Finally, we can use these two equalities to get A and B. A point to note is that no matter what the initial condition is, temperature distribution for the steady state heat equation is dictated mostly by the boundary conditions. This shows how important boundary conditions are to finding the solution. Another point is that remember how I set the source term to 1 before integrating? Uh, what if the source term is some weird complex function? Now you might be able to integrate this but I can't and, and even if I could, I don't want to. What I want is a way to get the solution no matter what the source term or diffusivity coefficients are. This is where we can look into numerical methods and then try to solve this numerically. In numerical methods, instead of using the continuous domain, we divide it into finite number of discrete points and then solve the PDE using the evaluations made at those points. Now you should have a few questions after looking at this. How exactly does this discretization help us or how can we actually solve a PDE using this framework? And what about the accuracy? When we use a few points to represent a continuous domain, don't we lose some information and more importantly, how much do we lose? To answer these questions, we'll need an understanding of finite differences and the accuracy analysis on those approximations. So in the part 2 of this series, I'll introduce finite differences along with the error analysis and then code up everything so that we can let a computer program do all the grunt work. If you found this video informative, please leave a like and let me know in the comments what do you liked and what do you think I should improve on. In the meantime, keep learning and I'll see you next time.